Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to uh, moderate our last panel of the day today. Thank you for hanging around. I think Leif is correct that we've saved the best for last. Uh, before taking office as governor in 2015, Greg Abbott served three terms, 12 years, as Texas Attorney General. Half of his time as AG overlapped with the first three quarters of the Obama administration. And countless times during those six years, General Abbott described his typical work day like this. I go to work, I sue the federal government, and I go home. <laughs> That's only a slight exaggeration. The type of litigation General Abbott filed against the Obama administration, a torch passed to and happily taken by General Paxton uh, over two and a half years ago, will be a big part of what we talk about in our last panel this afternoon. Our topic is federalism as a check on executive authority. And among other things, we will discuss the increasing prevalence of state versus federal government litigation, exemplified not only by Texas efforts against the Obama administration, but also by those of other states against the Trump administration, such as the attempts by New York, Washington, and others to shut down the travel ban. We'll also discuss the retrenchment of the administrative state and the assault over the last several years on the Chevron do doctrine. Now let's meet our panelists. Starting from my right and going to my left, uh, Professor Ernest A. Young is the Alston and Byrd Professor of Law at Duke University School of Law, where he teaches constitutional law, federal courts, and foreign relations law. He is one of the nation's leading authorities on the constitutional law of federalism, having written extensively on the Rehnquist Court's federalist revival and the difficulties confronting courts as they seek to draw lines between national and state authority. He is also an active commentator on foreign relations law where he focuses on the interaction between domestic and supranational courts and the application of international law by domestic courts. Professor Young also writes on constitutional interpretation and constitutional theory. And he has been known to dabble in maritime law and comparative constitutional law. Like many dabblers in maritime law, Professor Young was born in Abilene, Texas. <laughs> He joined the Duke Law fa faculty in 2008 after serving as the Charles Allen Wright Chair in Federal Courts at the University of Texas School of Law, where he had taught since 1999. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School, he clerked on the First Circuit for Judge Michael Boudin and on the United States Supreme Court for Justice David Souter. Professor Young practiced law at Cohen Simpson, Kalashaw and Wolf in Dallas and at Covington Burling in Washington, where he specialized in appellate litigation. He has also been a visiting law professor at both Harvard and Villanova, as well as an adjunct law professor at Georgetown. An elected member of the American Law Institute, Professor Young is an active participant in both public and private litigation in his areas of interest. He's, he's been the principal author of amicus briefs on behalf of leading constitutional scholars in several Supreme Court ca cases, including Medellin versus Texas, concerning presidential power and the authority of the International Court of Justice over domestic courts, and Gonzalez versus Reich, concerning federal power to regulate medical marijuana. Caitlin Halligan is a litigation partner in the New York office of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher and co-chair with our own Jim Ho of Gibson, Dunn's Appellate and Constitutional Law Practice Group. She has argued six cases and served as counsel of record in dozens of other matters at the United States Supreme Court. Ms. Halligan has also argued cases before the federal appellate courts, the New York Court of Appeals, and New York's intermediate appellate courts and participated in numerous other matters at the trial level as well. Before joining G Gibson Dunn, Ms. Halligan served as general counsel to the Manhattan DA's office from 2001 to 2007. Uh, she served as solicitor general for the state of New York, where she represented the state in federal and state appellate courts and supervised a team of 45 lawyers. Ms. Halligan was also the first chief of the New York Attorney General's Internet Bureau, where she developed law enforcement and policy initiatives regarding online consumer fraud, privacy, online securities trading, and other internet-related issues. Named by Benchmark Litigation as one of the top 250 women in litigation, Ms. Halligan has also served since 2005 as a member of Columbia Law School's adjunct faculty. She also served in a pro bono capacity as counsel to the board of the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, an entity charged with leading the redevelopment of the World Trade Center site in downtown Manhattan. She has served as a board member of the Fund for Modern Courts and the National Center for Law and Economic Development, as well as a member of several selection committees for the New York State Courts. Ms. Halligan was a law clerk for US Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer and DC Circuit Judge Patricia Wald. She graduated magna cum laude 
from the Georgetown University Law Center, where she served as managing editor of the Georgetown Law Review and participated as an Olin Fellow in Law and Economics. The Office of Texas Solicitor General was created by our lunchtime speaker, Senator John Cornyn, shortly after he became Attorney General of Texas in 1999. Since then, under Generals Cornyn, Abbott, and now Paxton, the office has been a leader among the states in litigation against the federal government and has been led by some of te Texas' most outstanding lawyers and appellate advocates. Our beloved Greg Coleman was the very first Texas Solicitor General, followed by Julie Parsley, Ted Cruz, Jim Ho, Jonathan Mitchell, and the office's current occupant and one of our distinguished panelists this afternoon, the Honorable Scott Keller. Before becoming Solicitor General, General Keller served as U U.S. Senator Ted Cruz's chief counsel and was an attorney at Yetter Coleman in Austin. He clerked for U.S. Supreme Court Justice a Anthony Kennedy, held a prestigious Bristow Fellowship in DOJ's Office of Solicitor General, and clerked for Ninth Circuit Judge Alex Kaczynski. His law degree comes from the University of Texas School of Law, where he was a student of one of our other panelists. Uh, he has argued eight cases before the United States Supreme Court and has another one scheduled in about a month. Finally, like New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees, General Keller is also a proud boilermaker, having received his bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy from Purdue University. Uh, these are our panelists. <laughs> the, th the four of us have come up with a very specific way to conduct our discussion this afternoon. Professor Young is going to ki kick us off by laying out the topic, making a few provocative sta statements, <laughs> and then letting our two panelists react and rebut, followed by some questions from y'all. Professor Young. Okay, well, thank you, Justice Brown. I want to thank my friend Aaron Street and the Federalist Society for having me back here. It's, it's good to be home in Texas, um, and it's particularly good to be on a panel with Caitlin, who I have known since I was a 2L in law school, and Scott, who I'm, whom I have known since he was a 2L in law school. <laughs> Um, I'm getting old enough that I'm starting to wonder whether I'm going to leave anything behind as, as an academic. And um, when I think about having had some part in the education of, of people like Scott and all, they, all that he's accomplished for the public and for this state, um, I'm just immeasurably proud. Um, Justice Brown stole my line about Governor Abbott. I was going to quote that, too. I think every discussion of state solicitors general and state public law litigation um, starts off with that for, for very good reason. What I want to do is, is share with you a, a li just the gist of, of a project that I'm working on with my colleague Maggie Lemos at, at Duke um, about the role of public litigation by states in our federal system. And in, in particular, we want to think about the role of these sorts of cases um, against a background of political polarization. So, so let me just start by talking a little bit about what we mean by polarization and the impact that it has on federalism and, and then move to the role that these cases can play in that. Um, and, and, you know, polarization can mean, you know, a lot of things, and, and you could be forgiven for just using it as a broad term to, co to convey the fact that everybody seems mad at everybody all the time. But, but the political scientists have a more specific definition, and, and it has to do with the parties having become coherent ideologically, right? For a long time, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party were big tents. They had both conservatives and liberals in both parties, and that actually facilitated a lot of bipartisan collaboration as people who were ideologically similar would cross the partisan line and, and vote together and, and, and help get things done. Um, that is almost completely not true anymore. There are very few Rockefeller Republicans or, or David Souter Republicans, if you will, left in the, in the Republican Party. There are very few, I would say, being from Abilene, uh, Charlie Stenholm Democrats or, or Sam Nunn type Democrats in the Democratic Party. Uh, you have parties that, that finally line up with the ideological divisions in American society. And, and that makes collaboration very difficult. The other thing that has changed is that the ideological difference between parties has broadened. So the political scientists like to map this on a continuum, and they, they assign scores, which I'm always a little skeptical of. But I think the general idea is true that the median Democrat disagrees more greatly with the median Republican than, than was true you know, 20 years ago. And so we have this situation of political polarization. Um, Federalism can be a safety valve for that, 
right? Because even though the party is 50-50, people of different ideological persuasions are not distributed evenly ge geographically, and so it may be possible to reach consensus within a state on, on certain you know, really divisive issues, even though you couldn't reach that at the national level. And in and, and some states, the old kind of party systems do still prevail. So in Massachusetts, they still have liberal Republicans, and in Mississippi, they still have conservative Democrats, and so it may be easier to do things in a bipartisan way at the state level. Um, and this, ought, this mechanism ought to be self-enforcing because the, the effect that polarization has at the national level, which is much more 50-50, tends to be gridlock. And so you would think that polarization would be good to the states because the federal government can't do much and, and the field would be left open for the states to handle these divisive questions and, they, and they'd be able to do a better job because they're not as polarized. Um, but actually what happens is polarization doesn't lead to gridlock so much as it leads to legislative gridlock, which in turn leads to executive action. Right? And so you see this both with you know, George Bush's um, efforts in, in the regulatory area to, to do tort reform through the executive branch, and, and you especially see it with you know, President Obama and his pen and phone saying, you know, we can't wait. I, you know, if Congress won't legislate on these, these weighty matters, then I will act alone. Right? And so this adds separation of powers to the mix of our debate about federalism. And, and it's why I think you have federalism creeping into this, this conference, which is primarily about executive power, because the effect of polarization, which ought to be to empower the states, is more to empower the executive. Now, what does this have to do with lawsuits by states? Um, we've seen a big increase in state government litigation activity on matters of public law. Um, government, Governor Abbott is just one example of that. Um, one reason for this is an institutional change that's largely independent of the national political picture, I think, and, and that's just the beefed up institutional capacity that you see at the state level. When I was clerking back in the mid-1990s, we asked Justice Souter, you know, who do you think is, is the most poorly represented um, group before the states? And looking back on it much, you know, much further, um, he said for a long time it, it was the state go governments, right? Not, crim not indigent criminal defendants. They, they get appointed great lawyers for them once they get the, to, the, to the Supreme Court. But the states were not well represented and they, they didn't have that much you know, institutional capacity to carry on high level litigation in a lot of contexts. And that has profoundly changed. And, and, I, and I think Governor At um, you know, Senator Cornyn was instrumental in that and, and there's been a lot of efforts in other states as well. The development of state solicitor general's offices and also a much broader litigation practice in state government. So that's one reason. But it's also a response to these developments at the national level. So gridlock means at the national level means that the state AGs have to step in on areas like pharmaceutical regulation and environmental regulation in the absence of action by Washington. Um, if, if you have a polarized national government that is dominated by one party for a, a short period of time, you can end up with quite extreme legislation. I would say the Obamacare legislation was an example of that, which in, ten, in turn tends to engender resistance at the state levels that are, are you know, made up of a very different political composition. Um, executive action leads to a fight to contest the content of national policy because the executive has to rely on the, these broad delegations of statutory authority that are imminently contestable as to what they mean, which prompts the, the states to jump in and say, well, no, I think actually the Clean Air Act means this rather than that, or the Immigration Act means this rather than that. Um, and then polarization, I think, also creates an imperative in state governments to express the point of view of their polity, which will, will often weigh in on one side or other of the ideological divide. So you saw a widespread state p participation as amici in the same-sex marriage litigation, I think, in order to express the sense of their states. It, it was a profoundly expressive function. Um, so you see, uh, I think polarization engenders this increase in litigation, in public litigation activity by states for a lot of different reasons, and it, and it takes a lot of different forms. So one form is the classic, you know, Texas sues the United States and a bunch of other states pile in, and then a bunch of other states that disagree pile in as amici on the, on the other side or interveners. 
But you also see just straight up state amic amicus participation. Um, that has risen radically in the last decade or so um, on questions like same-sex marriage, for instance. Um, you get you know, state amici coming in on both sides of questions like that. Um, you get efforts of the states to enforce federal law in ways that may differ from the enforcement priorities of the federal government itself. That would be the, the Arizona litigation, um, for example. Um, and then you also get state suits brought based on state law itself, but where the uh, intent is to achieve a settlement that will fun it, furnish basically a national in scope regulatory structure in lieu of federal law that's not getting made in Washington because of gridlock. And so it takes all these different kinds, and I think we should try to, try to keep all of them in mind. I'm going to focus mostly on litigation by the states against the federal government. Um, so let me advance two kind of propositions um, that come out of my work with Maggie, and then you know, Caitlin and Scott can pour cold water all over them um, if, if they like. But the first proposition would be that there's a distinction between two different kinds of conflict in a federal system. Um, and they have, and these two different kinds of conflict have different impacts on polarization. So I'm thinking of the distinction between vertical conflict, which I, by which I mean just conflict between the national government and the states. The national government seeks to expand its power, the states seek to limit it. So United States versus Lopez, where we're fighting about the scope of the Commerce Clause, um, would be a good example of that. And, and when you know, the states win a conflict like that, they're not really imposing any particular policy choice on other state governments. So if you strike down you know, the national law, that basically leaves the states free to do whatever they want in lieu of federal action. So that's a vertical conflict. And I would say the vertical conflicts are primarily about who decides on a given question. Will the states decide on their own and maybe come to different views, or will the federal government decide you know, one decision for the nation? Then there are horizontal conflicts. And, and if you think about it, I think in, in many ways the Constitution was meant to keep, even though we think about it, uh, uh, the federalism provisions of the Constitution as limiting the power of the federal government, I think the framers are at least as concerned with the need for a strong federal government to keep a lid on horizontal conflicts among the states or among groups of states. So if you think about the sectional conflicts between the North and the South, for instance. So a classic horizontal conflict would be the one that resulted in the fugitive slave law, where you know, one powerful group of states State, group of states is able to use the federal government as an instrument to impose their preferences on another group of states that disagrees. Right? And so these horizontal conflicts are not so much fights about who decides. You know, they want the federal government to decide. It's really a fight ab among different coalitions of states about what the content of federal policy will be. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think these different kinds of conflict have different impacts on polarization. So vertical disputes, if the states win a vertical dispute and say the federal government can't make a, a one decision for the whole country about this or that, that leaves the question open for the states to go different ways, right? And that may, uh, yeah, that allows the states to serve as a, as a safety valve for political polarization, right? We can agree to disagree because in our own home states we'll be able to implement the policy that a, that a solid majority you know, thinks is right. Um, I think that horizontal conflicts, on the other hand, are a means of just participating in polarization. So I, I think about the, clean, the successive waves of Clean Air Act litigation. So the blue states sue in Massachusetts versus EPA to say that the Clean Air Act requires the EPA to regulate you know, greenhouse gases. Right? They are trying to you know, not say that the, the state should be able to make their own decision about how to regulate the environment. They want the EPA to regulate for everyone in a, a more aggressive fashion. And then you have the states that challenge the Clean Coal Plan, the red states, um, that say, no, the Clean Air Act you know, forbids this sort of environmental regulation. But again, they're not saying we should be allowed to go our own way. We're saying the content of national environmental policy should be this. Right? So these suits by, by state governments are just an instrument of polarization. It's just one more arena in which polarization plays out. And the, so the proposition that I would you know, tentatively suggest is that from the standpoint of the system as a whole, these vertical disputes are more worthwhile than the horizontal ones. That if you're worried about preserving the ability of federalism to act as a mitigating factor for polarization, then you should like these vertical cases where we're trying to make sure that the states have the right to go their own way. And you should be more skeptical of the horizontal cases where the states are just participating in a polarized debate about what federal policy should be. 
right? So that's one proposition. The second proposition is about the relationship of federalism to separation of powers. Um, and my former students in the audience will recall that I'm not really capable of laying out a clean principle like vertical good, horizontal bad, um, without immediately fuzzing it up, all right? And so that's what I'm gonna do now. Separation of powers seems horizontal, right? It's about the horizontal relationship of the branches of the federal government. Um, nobody's saying, for instance, in, Mass in, a, um, in the Texas immigration case, for instance, that the federal government lacks authority to decide what national policy shall be on immigration. Right? We're saying it wasn't set in the correct way. It should have been Congress rather than the president, or at least they should have gone through the APA and notice and comment. Right? But, but either way, there's going to be a federal policy. Right? But federalism doesn't quit when an issue falls within Congress's enumerated powers. All the way back to Gibbons versus Ogden, Chief Justice Marshall recognized that the Commerce Clause conferred pretty broad authority on the national government to regulate, but within that sphere of the national government's enumerated power, there were still important structural checks on national action, and those, those checks tended to, to act in, in two ways. They both relied on the representation of the states in Congress, um, and because the states were represented, they had a voice, right? That's one way in which they were protected, but the other and probably more important way in which they were protected was that it's just hard to get anything done in Congress. Right? Have you noticed? It's, it's, it's hard to get anything through, right? Um, and so you could call that the procedural safeguards of federalism. Because it's so hard to get legislation through Congress, what's left when they can't act is autonomy for the states. All right? Now, delegation in the modern administrative state tends to circumvent all that, right? Um, it means that the statutory, because delegations are so broad, then the congressional check isn't really helping protect federalism anymore. But what has happened is that statutory limits on administrative power have come to stand in for the old separation of powers principles like the non-delegation doctrine that are proven nearly impossible to enforce. So two ways this, hap this happens. One is substantive review, where the courts hold the executive to the substantive constraints that Congress has built into a given statute. And then the other is procedural review, so notice and comment, for instance, which gives states a voice, and it makes rules difficult to enact. And so I would submit to you that these these separation of powers claims, like the Texas immigration claim, um, that purport to just be about how the federal government makes laws are actually terribly important vertical checks as well. Be, by making it more difficult to act, by making the federal government jump through all the separation of powers hoops that it has to jump through before it can legislate, these suits uh, as well are protecting the autonomy of the states in important ways. So all of this is just to say that separation of powers questions like the challenge to Chevron, for instance, have an important and federalism dimensions, and states are likely to play a key role in litigating those questions. And I think I'll stop there. Okay, well, I'm not sure this is on. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, First of all, let me say I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I spent some time growing up in Arkansas, and although I've been in New York City for a long time, when you wanted to go to a really big city and Little Rock would not do, uh, Houston or Dallas was always the destination of choice. So it remains a sentimental favorite for me. Um, as uh, the justice noted, I spent eight years in the New York Attorney General's office, most of those as Solicitor General of the state. And I think one of the things that has been remarkable to watch is the way in which states across the political aisle have really filled the public law space over the intervening 15 years or so. I think one thing we would all agree on up here, which is the proposition that states are significant actors in the public law space, there is not much debate about that. Uh, they are alive and well uh, in that arena. And I think it's interesting to speculate a little bit about why that is, what's behind that, and, and what's the impact uh, of states really engaged presence uh, in the public law space. So state AGs, 43 of them are elected, uh, 27 Republicans and 22 Democrats. Um, you also stole my line from uh, attorney, then Attorney General uh, Abbott, I go into the office, I sue the federal government, and I go home. I would hazard a guess that there are perhaps some blue state AGs who might say the same thing today. 
one of the one of the ways in which you see that play out is very basically, if you look at the number of cases that states get granted at the Supreme Court, a survey of cases, cert petitions filed 2001 to 2009, 4 percent of the cert petitions in paid cases are granted by the Supreme Court. 22 percent of the cases filed by states are granted. So even on the numbers, the states have a very active presence as parties. The participation in amicus briefs is off the charts sometimes on the same side of a case and often on opposite sides of cases. And you see the partisanship, I think, grow over the last 15 years in those cases. If you go through the Supreme Court's docket in any given term, you will see quite a few cases. And I would hazard a guess that almost any case involving a public law issue where you have briefs filed by states on both sides of the V, often joined by uh, a number of, of fellow states as well. So how did that come to be? I think one of the reasons is the point that you made, which is many states now have these wonderful opportunities for folks like Scott or myself to serve as Solicitor General. Uh, it is an office that I think has really grown in terms of uh, the opportunities that lawyers uh, see that it provides. If you like uh, litigating, and especially if you like anything relating to federal courts or public policy sorts of issues, I think it's hard to find a more engaging job anywhere in the country. And I think my partner, Jim Ho, who uh, uh, preceded you in this job, would say the same thing. So uh, I think one of the dynamics behind that has been this real uh, vein um, of opportunity that, that states have provided to often fairly junior lawyers. When I had the chance to serve as Solicitor General, of the state of New York. I'm sure I was way too young, um, but it was, it was a really marvelous uh, opportunity. I think an additional reason, and this is a little bit of an inside baseball point perhaps, is that the National Association of Attorneys General really has taken a, a leadership role in both coordinating advocacy among states on both sides of the red-blue line and also in really helping states to improve the quality of their advocacy before the Supreme Court, both in terms of uh, tutorials that they provide, moot court programs. So I think that that has allowed states to be much more confident and comfortable playing in that arena. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of energy that is spent um, by, by NAG in that respect. I think another reason is that there are some differences, and I'm speaking in broad brushstrokes here, but probably some differences between the state attorney general office and its federal counterparts. I think, first of all, and Scott and I were chatting a little bit about this before the program began, I think agreed about this, a lot less bureaucracy. Um, if your boss wants to tell you about a brief he or she wants to file or you want to get approval, no paperwork involved. You go down the hall and you talk to whoever is in the office a few doors down. And I think part of what that does is it um, allows for a much more entrepreneurial spirit among the states, whatever their political leanings might be, uh, than you might have in the federal government. I think that you have also a lot fewer people who come into those offices as you do in the federal agencies and spend their entire careers. I think you have... Um, a lot less risk aversion uh, among a number of those folks. And uh, you know, I think a lot of the attorneys general themselves view themselves in part, and a good bit of their uh, remit under state law is to serve as prosecutors. And I think that that also uh, probably encourages thinking about that office as a platform to bring uh, significant cases, um, whatever the policy goals are that you might have in mind. Ernie talks about putting all of these cases in the horizontal and the vertical uh, categories, and I think that's a very useful construct. The vertical cases, uh, I think, are, are maybe the, the less controversial in terms of the role of states. They certainly make for uh, interesting matters, and they're doctrinally sometimes very significant. They also can make for uh, curious positions. I remember when Kevin Newsom, who now recently uh, uh, confirmed to the Fifth Circuit, but then um, Solicitor General of the state of Alabama, filed a brief 
aligned with the state of California in Gonzalez versus Rach, which is the medical marijuana case. And his brief said, um, we don't happen to agree with the policy choice made by the state of California to legalize medical marijuana, um, but we certainly think that the state of California, like the state of Alabama, should be able to make whatever choice it wishes free from the dictates of the federal government. So those cases, I think, um, the interests of the states as institutions are fairly often aligned. And uh, the, the policy differences may be significant in terms of what choice is made. I, I think there is often a fair amount of unanimity there. I think the horizontal cases uh, are, are more uh, divisive, as I, I think uh, Ernie is suggesting. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about those in two different categories. First of all, as, as Ernie elaborated on, you have a lot of cases in which states are trying to influence the content of federal law. So just by way of example, um, you have a tremendous amount of litigation in this space uh, over environmental policy. Massachusetts versus EPA is one example, but you also have litigation that a lot of states engaged in, led by the state of West Virginia, opposing the Obama administration's Clean Power Plan. And I hazard a guess that you will have a fair amount more litigation um, as the Trump administration's EPA uh, issues or scales back on regulation. So you have a tremendous amount uh, in that, in that area in particular. Immigration is another area where you see uh, a huge amount of this, again, on both sides of the political aisle. I know you argued US versus Texas. Um, there's now, obviously, uh, litigation pending, um, maybe moot, maybe not. I guess we'll see um, over the travel ban. And uh, again, uh, the question there is both should the federal government act, and if the federal government acts, what should the policy choice, what should the substantive content of the policy be? And states want to have a role in influencing that. Uh, you see that as well on questions like uh, uh, the transgender bathroom case, right? What sh does Title IX mean, and what should the federal government's interpretation of that statute be? I, I guess my view on, on the propriety of that uh, is, is perhaps a little bit different than Ernie's. Um, you're absolutely right, Ernie, that these questions are often being resolved by executive action as opposed to by Congress. I think what that means is that the sorts of political safeguards for states that our Constitution teaches are present when you have Congress debating an issue are less available. And so I think there's an argument that when states participate in litigating about those choices, because the courts are the only institution to which they have resort to participate, that that may provide some access to participation um, that, that we think is there by virtue of the structure uh, of, of Congress when it is something that's being decided by the legislative branch. I think what is even more interesting, though, is a real swath of cases in which states are using their own laws to bring actions which result in setting national policy, either by the terms of a settlement on its face or simply because um, once you have a handful of states litigating with a major corporation over its practices, um, whatever comes out of that will end up being uh, national policy sort of by default. A couple of those that are worth touching on, I think, um, maybe the most well-known is the tobacco litigation, right? States brought these actions uh, in order largely to recoup dollars spent uh, on Medicaid funding. Um, that ended up really changing the face of tobacco sales in the country certainly also resulted in a significant transfer of money. But there are a lot of other areas where states have used their own state laws in this regard. State blue sky laws, the securities laws, are incredibly broad. Um, during the time that I was uh, in the Solicitor General's office, for example, the state of New York used those laws to really restructure the relationship between investment banks and sco uh, stock analysts. Also looked at market timing, for example. Right now, you see out of Massachusetts and New York, uh, as well as a number of other states, um, litigation that's underway against Exxon. Under the state blue sky laws, arguing that 
Exxon did not fully disclose the risks of climate change in its filings. Now, whatever you think about the, the, the substance uh, of those actions, one of the things that is really fascinating about it is you have 11 AGs lined up with Massachusetts and New York, and you have 11 AGs who filed an amicus brief on the other side of that litigation saying that the subpoenas that those states had issued should not be enforced and were not appropriate and, and ran afoul of the First Amendment. Those cases are a little bit, I think, more challenging if you are trying to justify them by allowing states to make their own policy decisions because you have one state that is really our, or a coalition of states that is acting in a way which can set the national policy agenda. And although these other states can come in and file an amicus brief, their ability to really uh, influence the course of that policy and the way that it is uh, uh, adjudicated, I think, is much more constrained. So I think that those are a little bit more, a little bit more challenging. Um, I think it's also interesting with those cases to ask the question of whether or not the states themselves are really accountable for the litigation choices that they make, especially if you think that one of the virtues of having state autonomy is that states are more accountable to the people than perhaps the national government is. Um, I, I think that there is a real question. It's an empirical question. I don't know what the answer is. But there's a real question about whether or not voters pay a lot of attention to this sort of AG activism and whether or not there is um, as meaningful a response at the ballot box to those kinds of decisions as you might see if a member of Congress, for example, made the same choice. It's hard to tell what the impact of, for example, media coverage when a state AG gets up and says, I filed a suit to do this, whether it's US versus Texas or Massachusetts versus EPA. Um, but I, I do think that, that probably for a lot of AGs, um, what they may put before the voters first is actually the more workaday consumer protection uh, work and other kinds of efforts that are protective of the voters in their state. Let me give you an example. I took a look this morning at the websites of the Texas and New Jersey, uh, sorry, Texas and New York attorneys general, um, because I figured that it would be some reasonable indication of what they thought was most on the minds of their voters in terms of their own efforts. And it was really striking because if you compare the two websites, what they highlight is mostly the same. Um, both of them are involved in a 41-state investigation of pharmaceutical companies that sell opioids. That's an example where I think states are aligned across the political spectrum in an effort to fill a gap they believe uh, that uh, the federal government has chosen not to uh, uh, fully engage in. Both websites, Hurricane Harvey and FEMA assistance, not surprisingly for Texas, but on the New York Attorney General website, uh, how to how to keep an eye on whether charitable giving for Hurricane Harvey is going to a reputable organization or not. Both websites, Equifax, data breach, synthetic drugs, some standard consumer protection points. And one point of distinction, New York's website uh, points out the role of the New York AG in the DACA litigation. And the Texas AG's website points out the role of the Texas AG in a case I'm sure you're very familiar with Scott, which is about uh, Senate Bill 4, uh, which has to do with the, the duty of Texas law enforcement. I assume it's a response to sanctuary cities questions. But, but it is really remarkable that on all of these topics, there is a chord, and then there is a point of disagreement. So while there may be, I think, some points of real partisanship and divide, um, and also meaningful ways for state AGs to actually influence the direction not only of federal law but of national policy through state law. There is also, I think, a lot of congruity in terms of the issues that are most central in their eyes to their constituents. One last point I think is interesting uh, to keep an eye on, and it's this. Um, Ernie remarked that part of what may be driving the increased engagement of states is a turn towards 
heavier reliance on unilateral executive action. But what that means is that those questions end up getting mediated through the courts, because what states are doing is suing, right? Um, whether they're suing as plaintiffs or whether they're filing as amicus briefs on one side or the other, it's the courts that have to decide questions like, is there standing? A question I would add, which is, is particularly, um, uh, I think, one that applies to both sides evenly. It's a great example of what sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Um, Massachusetts versus EPA, which is a, a case in which the Supreme Court said special solicitude to states uh, to give them standing in a case where, where private parties might well not have standing, was one that there were a number of AGs on the other side of. I took a look at the briefs in the US versus Texas case, um, which uh, uh, Scott uh, argued. Um, the US says, it gets its own point heading, Massachusetts versus EPA does not support respondents. And then you get a whole parade of horribles about what would happen if the states could actually litigate. Texas, on the other hand, um, cites Massachusetts versus EPA, and I realize this is a very lawyerly point to make, but just passim. It's so central to Texas's argument that uh, it's sprinkled throughout the brief, and, and Scott reiterates that states are due special solicitude. So, so you see this cutting in both directions, um, which I think is, is true about a lot of these kinds of dynamics in these state AG cases. But at the end of the day, it's the core who are really making that choice. And I think that's something that has, if not so much federalism implications, certainly very interesting separation of powers implications. Let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here in uh, Houston among so many friends. I just want to echo what Aaron said to kick off the conference. Uh, our thoughts are with you here in Houston after the hurricane. And I know my boss, General Paxton, uh, Governor Abbott, and many people, Senators Cruz and Corn, have been doing all they can uh, to help the city and to see the city come together after such a, a tragedy, I, I think is a testament to the spirit of this city. And so our thoughts are with you. Uh, I got to tell you, hearing about this Solicitor General's office gig, uh, it's exactly, you, you, might yeah, try that you know, I, it's, it's, I pinch myself when I go into work. I love my job. Uh, I get to stand at the podium and represent 27 million Texans uh, in an office that was created by Senator Cornyn, uh, one of my very good friends and close mentors, the late Greg Coleman, was the first Solicitor General of Texas. Uh, I count Ted Cruz and Jim Ho and the previous Solicitors General as my uh, friends, mentors, colleagues, and in so many ways, they established this office for what it is in a very similar way, Caitlin, that you established the New York office for what it is. We were talking earlier about the, the nature of some of these cases, and, and, and the cases on the timelines almost show the evolution of the state solicitor general's offices. And we started this off with Ernie's th thesis that you have this spike in state public law litigation. and. I'm going to get to why that maybe is happening as a matter of the law and politics, but none of that can actually happen if you don't have an apparatus within the states to actually be thinking about this plaintiff side <laughs> litigation. And I'll tell you, as a lawyer in state government, it's really easy when you're in a big office that is involved in all sorts of litigation that you're on the defensive side getting sued all the time to be focused on the defensive posture, but when you can pull out and think strategically uh, not only about amicus briefs in a particular case, but also what should we be challenging? Should we be moving resources into other uh, venues? I think that allows the states to actually think about when they should be litigating as plaintiffs. And, and so I think the phenomenon of state solicitor general's offices, besides upping the level of ad advocacy in the appellate courts for those states, most notably in the US Supreme Court, I think a, a collateral, maybe unintended consequence maybe intended, is that states have become much more savvy in plotting strategically lawsuits. Because I, I'm, I'm sure this is in the New York SG's office too, but in the Texas SG's office, we're rarely involved in the trial court. But there are some cases that we are absolutely involved in the trial court from day one when we know that it's going to turn into 
a bigger appellate case or, or a more notable public law case. Uh, and when you have these offices that have been developed like that, not only can you uh, attract certain individuals to come in and head up these offices, but I mean, I look throughout the room, I see alums from our office, I see current lawyers in our office, I see a future lawyer in our office, and it's really a, a, a testament to the people that came before me in the Texas Solicitor General's office to be able to create an environment for particularly younger lawyers to come in and get top-notch appellate experience, but also strategic litigation experience yes. in some of these huge cases that you probably wouldn't even be working on uh, in most law firms. And, and so I think in some ways, the phenomenon of state solicitors general, it, it just, it snowballed, uh, and the, I think the exponential growth on the plaintiff side of public law litigation by states is directly attributable to that phenomenon of state solicitor general's offices. So that's point one. The second point I would just make um, is, and, and pushing back a little bit on what Ernie and, and Caitlin have said, that these horizontal cases or when states are interjecting themselves into litigation uh, in an effort to, I will say, set federal policy or, or maybe push the scale one way or the other, at least from our perspective, we viewed it more as that federal policy was already set. It, it, Congress had already provided in statutes what the federal policy was. And through various, usually unilateral executive actions, what would occur was something that the state and other states thought, well, wait, we, we thought the rules were already set, and now you're changing them on us. And so then we would go to court to sue to block that unilateral executive action, not on the basis that we were trying to override some sense of what the federal rules should or shouldn't, or what they, what they shouldn't be, but rather that they were already established. And I'll just walk through a few of our you know, bigger cases from the last few years to, to show that. I mean, the first few are obviously a couple EPA cases, and these are ones where the federal government was in fact trying to use notice and comment rulemaking, as opposed to even more subformal rules. But take the EPA clean power case uh, that West Virginia and Texas led that Caitlin mentioned. I mean, there, what you were talking about was the Obama administration invoked a little known provision of the Clean Air Act, which is labeled Section 111D, and they used it for the first time in 25 years, and for about the fifth time ever, to rework the nation's entire energy grid in a way that would effectively implement a cap-and-trade policy through unilateral executive action when Congress specifically rejected that statute. And so that's an example where the states had already thought that that was set, that if Congress wanted to come and pass cap-and-trade, that, of course, was up to Congress. And if Congress had done it, the states would have had very little ground to challenge that. But instead, it was done through unilateral executive action. Same with the EPA Waters of the United States rule. This was a rule that would have granted the EPA, in some situations, regulatory authority over parcels of land that would have water on them about once every 100 years. It was a sweeping change in what EPA was going to be able to regulate, again, in a way that the states had thought that the, the statute had already been set. So those are two cases in which the, the federal government actually did try to use notice and comment rulemaking. In other words, we didn't even have a procedural objection. But there were also a host of other cases that were done not even through notice and comment rulemaking, but through subformal rules. And what I mean by that is a guidance document or a statement of policy. And to just put this in perspective, how far away we are from you know, Article I legislation, Congress is supposed to create legislation and because uh, the non-delegation doctrine essentially doesn't really provide, it provides a tiny amount of limit on what Congress can delegate. Congress has delegated large amounts of power to agencies, but in large part, it requires them to use notice and comment rulemaking before they're gonna make big policy, sh policy shifts. But what we saw particularly in the second term of the Obama presidency was not even using notice and comment for some of these big policy shifts. The biggest one would be DAPA and DACA, the immigration programs that would have granted lawful presence, work authorization, the earned income tax credit, Social Security, Medicare, even some situations a pathway to citizenship for about five million 
almost 50, per, well, 50% of aliens who are un, otherwise unlawfully present in the country. And that's a huge policy shift. It's one of the biggest changes in immigration policy in our nation's history, and it was done through a DHS guidance memo. And so when the states brought that lawsuit to challenge that, it wasn't that we were trying to override, for instance, New York's policy view on what immigration was or wouldn't be, or California's, it was we thought this was already set by Congress. And so by the states coming to court and being able to enforce what Congress had already provided, this in some ways was really, as Caitlin said, trying to make up for the lack of the political safeguards of federalism that are contained by our members of Congress who were represented by through the legislative process. DAPA and DACA wasn't the only example of that, though. The uh, Title IX uh, gender identity case, there was taking a view that the definition of gender identity, or sorry, the definition of sex that had been held for decades to not include gender identity, all of a sudden included that. Again, we're talking about a statutory phrase that the states, at least the states that brought suit, thought was settled. Uh, our EEOC case is similar in that regard. Uh, the Obama administration put out, again, a subformal rule saying that disparate impact liability in the employment context would ban all instances of a categorical prohibition on, employed, uh, on employing uh, people that had been convicted of a felony. Again, this was an example of something the states had thought was already settled by statute. I could keep going through various examples, but, but the point is I, I think what was driving a lot of the recent explosion of state public law litigation, particularly in the last five years, is actually a use of unilateral executive power in the domestic context that we really haven't seen before. And in some ways, you can kind of trace it back to Massachusetts versus EPA, because that obviously would set the fact that states have special solicitude in the standing analysis to get into court. But I, I'm not even sure in a lot of these cases that we even needed special solicitude. In fact, that was one of our arguments in the DAPA case was we really have standing in light of this, but we don't need it. And so I don't think you can necessarily even trace it back to standing rules from the US Supreme Court. I think it really is just a different view on when executive power was going to be used and using it in a fundamentally new way. Uh, and, to be fair to my friends on the left, I take the travel ban case. We filed a brief, and for the arguments you've heard earlier that Brantley and Allison had made, uh, there in fact is capacious authority for the president to actually implement this travel ban. But we'll admit, I, I, you know, picking six different countries out and applying that power in that way, that is not something that a president has done on that magnitude, I believe, in, in selecting that many countries. And we believe it's lawful, but in thinking about the ways that executive power is being used now, I think we are starting to see a shift away from believing that Congress should be taking care of any of these issues. And instead, we're all almost now, and I don't think this is a good thing, assuming that how these issues will be resolved is in the courts in state versus federal litigation. Uh, and, and maybe the left and the right also need to have a very honest conversation about the scope of delegated power to the executive branch. Uh, you know, on the left, if you don't like the travel ban, well, maybe 1182F needs to be reconsidered and amended. Maybe not. But that, that's a policy decision that really should be made in Congress. And there are all sorts of reasons why you could think that Congress is the gridlock and the polarization uh, is there. But that is a feature, not a bug of the system. And I'm not sure that it does our polity a lot of good to be assuming that what is supposed to happen is every time one administration of a party leaves office and another comes in, that you're going to face a barrage of lawsuits from a different pocket of states that disagrees with that policy decision. I, th I think the founders of our country would not see that we are in the uh, state of affairs regarding our judiciary in that regard uh, that they probably would have ever thought. Uh, so I started all this by saying that the, the, the trend of Solicitor General's offices was a fantastic thing. It is. 
But I think this is one of the unintended consequences of it, that uh, you're getting savvy litigants, and savvy litigants are going to do exactly what they should do, and that's they're going to bring their A game, and they're going to do the best they can for their clients. So in conclusion, I love my job, but we're going to continue to file briefs, and I'm sure the state of New York is going to be doing the same thing. <clears throat> Professor Young, any thoughts on what our SGs have said? Well, I mean, I learn an immense amount every time I talk to people who actually do this for a living. Um, I don't mean to say either that there's a sharp line between horizontal and vertical cases. I think, I think it's probably more useful to think of most cases have both dimensions, but, but in any given situation, one may be more prominent than the other. Um, the other thing is I, I don't mean to say that states can afford to forego a lot of these horizontal disputes given that that is how the game is being played, any more than one party can just unilaterally say, we don't like polarization, so we're not going to play the game anymore. I mean, nobody can afford to do that. I do think there's a difference between, say, the bathrooms case where the question is, does title, does the statute even speak to this question? And if the answer is no, then it, it doesn't foreclose a state from going either way. And some, but not all, of the Clean Air Act um, phases where the dispute really is about you know, a rule that will bind everyone no matter which position you adopt, right? I, I think one, that one's more horizontal. And I think the institutional interests of the states, particularly if we care about using states as a, as a safety valve for polarization, ought to be to emphasize ways in which federal law can be argued to just not speak to a question, to, to leave it open for states where people disagree. Um, the other thing I'd love to hear you two talk a little more about is the accountability question. So I mean, AGs are elected, but, it, but it's hard to say how much of a factor these you know, cases are you know, when people actually go to the polls. Um, I think it's also... Um, a question whether these cases affect people in other states that don't get to vote for the SG that's bringing the case, right? And, and if there's anything to be done about those kind of spillover mechanisms. Um, and then finally, I, I think in asking about accountability, how do states compare? There's a compare to what dimension to it, right? Which is how do states compare in accountability to other actors that might bring similar cases, like non-governmental organizations, like the ACLU is an example, um, or you know the private bar bringing class actions. So you know you guys are actually in the politics of this. I, I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, it might surprise the audience if I were to tell you that there's a lot of what my fellow panelists said that I agree with. Um, first of all, Ernie, you know, the, the, the point that a lot of public law is being made right now by the executive as opposed to Congress means that it is ripe with opportunities for litigation. Because when Congress decides to take something up, unless you're going to argue that it lies outside the scope of the commerce power, which is a hard road to hoe under current doctrine, there is not a lot of litigation to challenge the decision itself. When it's the executive that acts, whether through some sort of notice and comment rulemaking that is subject to the procedural requirements of the APA or outside of that, there are often many grounds on which you can challenge that action. You can say that it doesn't comply with the terms of the statute, which, Scott, I think is what you were saying characterizes a lot of litigation over the past five years. And I would say characterized a lot of the litigation during the tenure of the Bush administration brought by a number of blue state AGs. We may have different views about what statutes mean and whether certain regulations comply with them or not. In addition, when the executive is acting absent any clear anchor in the regulatory process, there are important questions about whether that is something that the president is permitted to do. And so what I think will be really interesting to watch is you know, there's certainly an opportunity for, I think, congressional action 
on a number of fronts, given that you have the same party in control, both of Congress and the White House. But time will tell whether that plays out. If that doesn't happen, and the executive branch acts, whether through regulation or outside of the, of the confines of the APA, to change policies, there will be the same set of questions about whether those determinations conform to the terms of the statute, whether the procedural requirements of the APA have been adhered to. Um, and, and I think that, that those cases will unfold in much the same way that the litigation against the Obama administration initiatives have unfolded as well. Another example of sauce for the goose and sauce for the gander, I think. Yeah, no, I think you're going to see the, the, I mean, the state playbook now of we have standing, there's a notice and comment violation, and we need a nationwide injunction. I mean, that, that's going to be run now. And how I think. fast can we get to the courthouse? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of times you're going to be seeing that coming up. And it's funny, like, just to go back to Massachusetts versus EPA, to be completely fair in this issue, I mean, Texas was opposed to standing in Massachusetts. I, I do EPA. remember that. So we've been kind of volleying. Having this been issue on the other side. Uh, and so the irony now, I mean, I'm sure you felt this way, but now when we get a brief from, say, California or New York in 2017, citing Texas versus United States for the proposition that, yes, you have standing and yes, you can get a nationwide injunction, when they were telling us in their own amicus briefs, no, we in fact couldn't get that when we were bringing our own lawsuit, we said, okay. We're, we're, we agree with you. Finally, we're glad that we convinced you now. Uh, so it took a while, but we're on board. Again, perhaps less division than one might think. Exactly. On some issues. Some issues. Well, we've got about uh, 15 minutes left. Um, we can take some, some questions. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask the first one. This is something that I, I like having a couple of SGs that I can pose this to. Uh, and then we'll get to some audience <laughs> questions. Um, I, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, the, ca the cases you get to choose to bring versus the ones that come to you as SG. And all three of you have touched on this a little bit. I've always kind of felt sorry for Jim Ho from when he was uh, um, SG because Ted Cruz got Medellin. He got the Ten Commandments case, which Abbott argued, but he briefed, and all these other cases where he got to argue these red meat issues on the conservative red meat side and Jim Ho shows up after Ted moves on to greener pastures and what does Ho get but to defend UT's affirmative action policy <laughs> um, and uh, uh, but, he, but he did it dutifully uh, like Kevin Bacon and a few good men I, uh, who said uh, I, I represent the government of the United States without passion or president pre passion or prejudice and my client has a case and that's the way uh, it seems to me a good SG handles cases that come at him or her. It's a proud, it is a proud tradition. Um, Joe Greenhill had to defend Heman versus Sweat against Thurgood Marshall back when he was in the AG's office. Uh, but it's not always how it works everywhere. The Obama administration uh, refused to defend DOMA. Uh, Jerry Brown and Kamala Harris in California refused to defend Prop 8. Uh, and uh, a lot of people would say that that was a dereliction of duty. And so I would, I'd like to ask uh, Y'all, how did how did those kinds of considerations come into play when you've got to choose uh, what cases you're going to step up and defend, what cases you might not, what cases you're going to take, what cases you're going to let let slide by? Well, in the New York office, I think each state is different, right? Um, and is a function of the way that Attorney General has decided to structure that office. In the New York office, we handled all of the appeals. That meant everything from a slip and fall case on state property to significant and sometimes the most controversial cases, which were cases about state statutes or state programs that were being challenged in the state high court on constitutional or statutory grounds. Those tended to be very contentious. For example, education financing litigation, uh, the death penalty. Um, and also did all of the, um, we called it affirmative litigation, plaintiff litigation, whatever name you want to put on it. The first case I argued in the Supreme Court as Solicitor General was actually a case about liquor um, and whether or not the state's 
three-tier uh, liquor distribution system was constitutional or unconstitutional. For all of you who order your wine online, it turned out to be unconstitutional. But, but a, range, a range of cases, and I think one can and should always take pride in standing up and saying that you represent the people of whether it's the United States, the state of New York, when I was in the DA's office, uh, the uh, uh, people of the state uh, of the city of New York, I think that there's real, real honor in that. Yeah, I think there's a couple different questions there. One is just how does each solicitor general's office operate as far as selecting cases or taking them all? And the second question is more of how does each particular attorney general view their duty to defend statutes or rules? In Texas, the SG's office is very different than New York. In New York, they handle all the appeals. In Texas, there are 18 lawyers in the Texas SG's office. There are probably about 50-some yeah, in New York-ish now. Uh, we only do a fraction of the appeals for the state of Texas in the Texas AG's office. Most of the appeals are handled by the different litigating divisions within the AG's office. And so the resources in the Texas SG's office are directed specifically at the highest profile, biggest precedent setting cases. And so we have a lot of, we have free reign for the most part on what cases that we're selecting to actually bring into the SG's office. And we have a similar appeal memo process to what the US Solicitor General's office has to, to keep a, a tabs on the docket and also to select the cases that are coming in. And as far as the duty to defend, uh, I, I think some of it also can, you can break that down into, well, even if the Attorney General's office is not gonna defend it, will they approve an outside counsel arrangement? Uh, and, and we've seen a few of those too. So off the top of my head, I can't think of an example uh, under Attorney General Paxton, where the state has categorically said we're not going to defend something and not going to even allow outside counsel to defend it either, which I think is an important distinction from just shutting down and saying, no, we're not even going to court. You don't get to have that statute or rule. I can't think of any example either for Paxton or Abbott, and I, I think I happen to think that's the way that's the way you should do it. Is you should. Uh, take everything that comes in. But um, the uh, let's hear from the audience some questions, please. I was very interested to hear from Professor Young about the vertical between states and federal. And I think that's the issue that uh, over the two centuries that our country has started, uh, the states have gotten less and less power and the federal government has gotten more and more power. Uh, and I would, uh, with due respect to the Solicitor Generals on the panel, uh, I, I'm a head of an organization called Texas Constitutional Enforcement. And our, we're dedicated to the proposition. Uh, we do look at the Tenth Amendment, uh, and we look at the rest of the Constitution. And we do not think that the Constitution delegated the power to be the final arbiter of constitutional meaning to the federal government, especially the judicial branch. We are not federal judicial supremacist. We believe that our elected officials in Texas uh, should be the final arbiters of constitutional meaning. We believe our elected uh, Supreme Court, our, our, uh, our Attorney General, our Governor, and our legislature should be doing that. And we should declare what constitutional meaning is and then insist that it be honored. And but in, in the background wall of our, our, our Facebook page has a picture of the guys at Goliad. And what we say is, uh, suing in federal court is the Goliad approach to fighting for liberty. You surrender the decision about your fate to the very tyrant you're fighting, and then you get massacred. Uh, we don't so get massacred. Uh, We're winning. <laughs> uh, not all, not, all, not all, all the time. I, I'd like to see your batting average. But uh, anyway, what I wanted to find out. Although from, I've seen yeah. him in court, and he's very good. But. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but Professor Young, I, I'll ask you, and I'd love to hear from the rest of the panel. Uh, do you think we should defer? to the Supreme Court to be our supreme rulers, or should we start declaring what constitutional meaning is right here in Texas with our elected officials? I think the fear has always been that if the buck doesn't stop somewhere, then you lose the guarantee of a peaceful resolution of disputes, right? If, there, if there's no final arbiter, um, no one, one, one court to rule them all, um, <laughs> then... <laughs> Then you don't get one final answer, and you know the framers, you know, the Federalist Papers were pretty clear that they thought those disputes would be settled by force, 
And so that, that's always been the assumption. Now, I've been doing some work on Europe and the operation of the court systems in the, in the European Union. And one thing that I think a lot of people don't recognize is that they don't have one court to rule them all in the same way that we do, even on questions of European law. So for instance, the German Constitutional Court has insisted that they are the final arbiter on whether European law you know, coming out of Brussels is consistent with the European Union's you know, founding treaties and therefore can validly preempt German law. And they say that the German constitution requires them to play that role. Um, and, and some of the constitutional courts in Europe also take the view that, state, that their member state constitutions are supreme over European law. The, 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 you know, we assume under the supremacy clause that every kind of federal law is supreme over every kind of state law. Well, you know, so a federal regulation can trump the state constitution. They, they, do, they manage to have a different view on these foundational questions. And last time I checked, the sky had not fallen in Europe. Right, um, so it is possible to run a at least a quasi-federal system on a different set of principles. Now, I think the way they get by, though, is that there is so much mutual deference and accommodation that these questions never are allowed to actually come to a head. Right, um, and so I don't know if our legal culture is in the same place. I think the, these questions would be pushed to their ultimate resolution. And, and you can't have a, if, if, if you think the questions are going to go all the way, then you need to have a plan for how you're going to resolve it ultimately and get one final say. They can avoid that because they have, they have preserved a sense of, of legal and, and political restraint in some ways that, that we just don't have right now. So I, don't, I, I think it's actually more possible for your world to exist than, than most people would say. Um, but I'm not sure it can exist under our current state of politics. Good afternoon. I'm, my name is Mark Yablon, and my question is to be narrowed to the more the plaintiff side of the AG's work, and that is, what do you, what's the calculus that you use when you might have all three aligned, the legislature, the governor, and the AG, Solicitor General, versus when the a, uh, AG might be polar opposite of the legislature and the governor when you're going to pursue a case, an elective case. I'll give you an example of that, if, if I can. Um, when I was state SG, there was a lot of thinking that the US Supreme Court was doing in the 11th Amendment arena and the extent to which states were amenable to lawsuits for damages. Um, and we looked very closely at those cases before deciding whether there was any room to participate as an amicus because my client was the governor and the state agencies were my client. And so if they had exposure, liability, cases in the pipeline, um, that mattered. Uh, now, there are a lot of these cases where I think there's not such a direct conflict that might arise, um, but uh, th that was the way we navigated it. I don't know what your experience is, Scott. Yeah, I mean, at least in Texas, the Texas Attorney General's office, it's pretty settled, has the authority to represent the state. And obviously, in weighing when to bring a lawsuit, you're going to consider, and the Attorney General considers the like all factors that even if you would have the power, it doesn't necessarily mean you're bringing the lawsuit. But at the end of the day, in Texas, the buck stops with the attorney general and the determination uh, as far mm -hmm. as that. So yeah, there, there could be different uh, views as to whether a lawsuit should be brought and maybe some legislators or the governor or occasionally can have different views on this. But, but by and large, at least in the current state of Texas politics, where you have one political party that is controlling each of the branches, there really aren't disagreements of that sort. But I know from talking to some of my fellow SGs that are in other states where, you know, the governorship is held by the opposing party that the SG, has, that they, there are disputes over that. And sometimes they've even gotten into litigation. Yeah, and right. Colorado is a great example of that. And when I was SG, you know, the AG was uh, a Democrat, uh, my boss, and the governor was a Republican. So it was divided that way, and, and we worked through those issues and worked closely with his counsel. We might have time for one more if there is another one. Otherwise, here we go. Uh, 
I had a question about the playbook you mentioned that includes nationwide injunctions. Yeah, it's no secret anymore. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> my, I'm, a, I'm a patent lawyer, so I'm ignorant about all this stuff. My impression is that's a, a growing thing, and it seems to fall under what Professor Young called sort of a horizontal conflict, but maybe in judicial federalism as opposed to sort of legislative and state federalism. So number one, is that a growing thing, or is it just my imagination from some of the recent big picture cases where people were on the right seem to be very happy when they got it on DAPA and then very unhappy and complain about judicial overreach when it happened in the context of the travel ban? And number two, how should we think about that as federal society types, both in terms of AG's and SG's office seeking those and judiciary members granting them? I can give you a very direct example. We filed amicus briefs supporting the administration in the travel ban case, but we argued that the ban itself was substantively lawful. We did not dispute the state standing. We did not dispute that it would be proper to issue a nationwide injunction. And so I think this is where, you know, rather than sit here and volley back and forth between do states have standing, I think almost every state has now signed on to the proposition that yes, states should have special solicitude. And you can say that that is a unique rule for states or it's just recognizing that there is something different about a sovereign state mm -hmm. in our system that you can have concrete injuries as a state that no other party could. And so I think you know, most of the debates, at least at the state level, and, and the United States DOJ would dispute this, but I think by and large, it's now most states have settled on the fact that yes, you can have special solicitude, and yes, you can get nationwide injunctions, and the debate among the states then is largely about is the policy itself lawful. Makes sense. Okay, well, let's hear it for our three panelists. Um, hi, my name is Lisa Ezel. I'm the vice president for the Federalist Society's Lawyers Chapters. And before we conclude, I would be remiss if I didn't use this opportunity to thank our Houston chapter here for hosting us this weekend. Um, we are so thrilled that we could come here after the last uh, several weeks here. And I want to express my deep uh, gratitude to our leadership here in Houston, um, especially Aaron Street, who, um, when I called him earlier this year to ask him not only to, to take the realms of this conference, but also to lead the Houston chapter after some leadership changes. Um, so great, I'm so grateful for you for all of your leadership here this year. Um, also want to recognize um, the rest of the team who have planned the conference this weekend. Uh, Marcella Burke, Catherine Eschbach, James Lloyd, Will Peterson, Charles Eskridge, Leif Olson, Michelle Stratton, um, and the rest of the Houston uh, Steering Committee. Thank you so much for your hard work. I think this was a, a great success. Um, we're so, again, so happy that we could be here and have a very successful um, third annual conference here in Texas. So um, thanks to all of the panelists. Um, I think this was um, thanks to our volunteers. I want to thank my colleague, Sarah Landine, who um, was very patient in trying to contact the Houstonian to make sure that the doors would be open for us to, to host, uh, host us this weekend. And uh, we're grateful to the staff at the Houstonian, who um, we were the first group back in the hotel after the hurricane. So we're very grateful for how hard they worked to, to have this um, conference facility uh, operational for all of us. So with that, um, I hate to be the um, what's keeping everyone from the closing reception and an open bar. So thank you again, um, and we look forward to some more hospitality and fellowship outside. Thank you.